the system will become more and more domineering and more controlling in order to maintain order and structure as uh, the physical world diminishes. And that's not, that could go on for a long, long time. Today's guest is John Robb, who currently publishes the Global Gorillas Report, which covers the intersection of war, politics, and technology. Uh, John served as a tier one special ops in the military, after which he became a popular internet analyst, entrepreneur, and the COO of a software company that open sourced the current RSS standard. Uh, John also published the book Brave New War, which was on the subject of the future of warfare. Uh, this may appear to be an oddball episode on The Great Simplification, but I've followed John uh, for a long time now, and many in my inner circle uh, make an effort to pay attention to what he says. Uh, this was a wide ranging conversation. We discussed AI, augmented reality, uh, information and sense making, tribal warfare, fictive kinship, and even asteroid mining, which you might guess I am incredibly skeptical of. But I was also skeptical of things he said 20 years uh, ago, which are our current reality. In any case, I do not think you will be bored. Please welcome John Robb. John Robb, great to see you. Hi, Nate. How's it going today? It's going pretty good. So, um, I've known of your work, uh, kind of from a distance for a very long time. You've been kind of ahead of the curve on, on many issues, uh, pertaining to technology, um, and global systems. Um, you've been an active speaker, um, for, on an array of topics. You have a Substack, uh, uh, et cetera. Yet probably a lot of listeners on my program are not familiar with you. Can you bring us up to speed, give us a little bit of your background, how you got where you are today and, and what you're doing now? Sure. Um, astronautical engineer, pilot of the Air Force, special ops with uh, tier one special ops with Delta and Teal Team 6 for about five years. And then um, first internet analyst, 95 through 97. At least the first one I think that got paid and got interviewed, quoted by everybody, New York Times to CNBC and whatever. Then I did entrepreneurial stuff in finance. Um, we did a, a site and whatever, and it ended up selling for about three hundred million. And then went on to uh, work on uh, social networking back in two thousand one. Kicked that off. Uh, the first social networks, you know, RSS came out of our little company, which was really simple syndication back then. And um, we grew social networking from there, got New York Times involved and everything else. And everything you see on Twitter and Facebook is pretty much looks exactly what we had back back then, uh, long before they even started as companies. Um, so back in 2003, I wrote, a, I started writing a blog, Global Gorillas blog on warfare. And it was really basically describing what I uh, was seeing in Iraq that was different uh, than uh, what the news was saying. And I ended up writing a book, Brave New War, did a big circuit with CIA, NSA, that whole crowd, worked for the Joint Chiefs on future autonomous weapons. And most recently, I've been focusing on um, what I call uh, the intersection of technology, warfare, and politics. So how online movements from um, you know the protest movements that we saw a couple of years back to the network tribes that are battling it out online and, and globally. Your current work then focuses on uh, the evolution of warfare into today's online uh, warfare. Can you, can you explain the three realms of war warfare, what those are and how engagement and them has changed over the last century? Well, the three realms of warfare, so using Boyd's John Boyd's framework and John Boyd is the Arguably, the America's best strategic thinker. He's from the military side, kind of a maverick, but his stuff is right on in terms of how people make decisions and how armies and militaries make decisions. Um, the three realms are, you know, moral um, and physical and uh, psychological. And um, moral warfare is very much what we see in guerrilla warfare, and it's very 
similar to a lot of the things that we see online, um, a lot of what we're experiencing is moral warfare. Uh, psychological realm is a lot of the disruptive elements that we saw with Trump and others, whether it's fast maneuvers between topics um, and uh, moving so quickly from one topic to the next that the, your enemy can't create a, 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 a cogent response. So whenever you saw Trump moving the topic every other day um that was an example of that kind of maneuver warfare did he naturally just do that or was he a student of this sort of strategy i think he naturally did it uh, it uh it fit his style it fit uh his role in the insurgency uh, i called it an open source insurgency that got him elected and put him in office um uh is is it also uh, worked really well with his superpower, which is really basically being able to circumnavigate the media using Twitter. And um, you know, Twitter got him out to millions of people every day, uh, tens of millions uh, or more. And um, he could he could set the agenda. So whenever he was facing pressure from one quarter, he was able to change the topic or create an incident that allowed him to shift the conversation away from that. And um, a very effective you know maneuver for disrupting the psychology of the opponent and the final is a, a physical realm which is mostly attrition it's basically wearing down the enemy and eliminating uh in the online world we see that with big companies who are disconnecting physically disconnecting opponents so if you're banned and you're disconnected that's attrition warfare um and that uh it, in the physical world it's it's more uh Artillery wearing down the enemy, making them um, physically unable to defend themselves or continue on with the war effort. So um, those are the three realms that I'm dealing with, and, and I work them into the online framework. So I'm going to get to the online framework in a second, but on a, on a broader sense, you used to be, well, you just said, one of the very first internet analysts. Um, and so you're, you're thinking ahead on these issues is war and the resulting or inferred game theory that is attached to it um, part of our evolutionary heritage? Why, why is, are these mechanics so describable and, and predictable and observable? Well, what I try to do, at least with my work, is to see patterns, uh, see uh, frameworks that are potentially useful in being predictive of what's coming. Um, there's a couple of reasons why we're seeing warfare in the in the current environment. Uh, one was McLuhan predicted this a long time ago, long, well before me, back in the '60s, when he said, "You know, World War III will be a guerrilla information war where everyone's a combatant," and that describes very much where we're at: was that where everybody's fighting over everything, and basically the you know how we value things, um, and uh, that fits you know very well with this environment. Um, another. Potential reason why we're in this situation is that, uh, you know, now that we hit the global level, we're starting to turn inwards, and any inward focus system tends to um, collapse, head towards you know entropy accumulation and death, and this is just a natural outcome of that decay process. Is that we'll start fighting with each other over all sorts of dumb stuff, um, and uh, it'll only intensify as 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 we. Uh, reach the end point why did we become inwardly focused and how would you define that well i mean McLuhan would say that we're all becoming global villagers when he said global village it wasn't like a positive thing and villagers are bloody minded they're nosy they're into everybody's business and anyone who steps outside of what they perceive uh, you know the normal behavior is attacked um in terms of uh why we're focused inward is that our model for the world has reached the size of the world. <laughs> and um, I was digging into Boyd's theories on this, and, he, and, and, and basically what happens is that uh, when you're not moving forward anymore, you're not expanding anymore, you start to focus on increasing the resolution of the, increasing your understanding of what is inside the model. Um, and er, as you start to push down on that, uh, what you'll find is more inconsistencies, more uh, anomalies, more uncertainties, um, and those will grow and increasingly screw up your decision-making process. 
Uh, I mean, we're in a world where we came up with the word microaggression, right? <laughs> That's the kind of thing, like inward focus that, that, that we're talking about is that, uh, and that uh, when the decisions go badly, we'll see states and we'll see corporations, we'll see network tribes try to push for coercive mes- uh, methods to force everybody into line to uh, like COVID responses that I don't care if you think differently, I'm going to force you to th- think this way because you're, you know, all the other all the other methods I've used to try to convince you of doing something aren't working. So this is something, uh, and we'll get back to your your tribal moral warfare in a second. But this is something I've always worried about and intuited that there's a limits to growth uh, reality in our biophysical system. There's oil and uh, copper and uh, sink capacities at such and. By the way, there was a thing came out last week that was a, an update on the limits to growth study um, from 50 years ago, and it's like spot on tracking. Uh, it's remarkable how accurate it was. But there's the physical response. But as all that is happening, there's the social limits to growth that are hit right. before the actual physical limits. And what you're saying is that all these uh, turning inwardly, even though we're at the peak of resources of all time on our planet, there are these psychological dynamics that start to fray um, and affect the social contract. Correct. Yeah, it's a a bad way of describing it would be kind of like, it, this is a peak Petri dish moment. <laughs> you know, you see that experiment where the pe- you know, put the bacteria in the Petri dish and the population expands very quickly and it hits the limit of that system. Um, it can't go any farther, can't go any, um, can't get outside of that petri dish and everything starts to, all that entropy, all that foul stuff starts to accumulate and kill. Except f- from a strict biophysical standpoint, there is enough food and energy and resources for that amount of um, bacteria or humans and even more. But it's the the expectations and the social dynamics don't allow for that that pathway to emerge. Yeah, I think I think that would be true. Um, but you know it, what what ends up happening is that we focus inward on on finding ways how best to fix everything, and there's a never ending list of things that we have to fix, and <laughs> there's no end point to that. Um, too much inward contemplation is is a, it's like people who are hypochondriacs or, or overthink their their uh, inward journey or constantly going well i was thinking this and you know, this thing happened and i'm you know if that inward focus is is debilitating and um especially at a societal level especially at a global level um and um we need an exterior environment you need to get out of the house sometimes you know you need to get like out and about see an outside world that you don't control um, in order to maintain maintain mental health. Yeah, um, well, I certainly I certainly agree with that. Um, how much of this is because of the meaning crisis that we had? Um, you know, the the dominance of global religions right. uh, as a agreed upon tribal grouping for a long time and then implicitly though a lot of people didn't really state this outwardly but we had economic growth for a long time and a very steep economic growth which is now of course waning and only being supported by extraordinary measures by by government central banks etc so is it is it this subconscious quest for some meaning and direction and goal that makes sense to people that is uh, driving some of this uh, networked tribalism? Well, things are definitely changing. Um, As somebody who's been out, you know, and just done stuff, (laughs) you know, a lot of more operational level stuff is that uh, you tend to think more about meaning when you're not doing that, when you're, when you're um, uh, stuck at home or stuck, you know, idle and and not moving forward and not actually getting things done um but definitely there is there is a shift underway um the network is trying to uh create its own values framework um and uh, determine what's good what's bad and kind of dictate that um and it's not going well and it's clashing with traditional sources of of meaning and valuation uh, you know what's good in a life 
Um, and that's going to take some time to hash out. I, you know, I, I don't see that as a, as a, a fatal problem for us. It's, I think that's a, you know, a problem of change and accommodation of, 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 of the technologies and what's possible. Um, it could be fatal if we see the network become completely dominant and enforces few. And that's like, I've described that as the long night scenario is that, uh, networking and AI in, in combination provide the means for the most aggressive and intrusive and controlling system that we ever could imagine, um, that will be in all our lives and control our perceptions of everything. Um, that, you know, AI, not just scolding you is AI as a persuasive ent entity. Is that you know, I remember um, um, the CEO of OpenAI said the superpower we're going to see this the uh, greater than human intelligence we see out of OpenAI AI, the AGI that comes out of that will probably uh, be most evident in its ability to persuade. Above all, um, and that's kind of that kind of scenario is something I would I want to avoid. And what I'd rather have is. Uh, more decentralized approach where uh, we have uh, a lot of pockets of, of, of people developing ways to live with this technology, live with on the earth in a, in a positive and you know, sustainable way, in a, in a good way. Um, and maybe one of those you know, pockets of, of, of innovation will yield a solution that we all can adopt in the future if the other ones fail. But by one having it all one, we're, we're risking complete collapse. I'm not an expert on AI, uh, but I think it's important to wade into some of the things you've just said. So on sure. OpenAI, uh, the the parent of of Chat GPT, the various versions, um, I've noticed that these Chat GPTs, which is not all AI, there's lots of AI uh, and machine learning and other categories. It's not just the chat bots, but a lot of these chatbots are really biased, um, depending on how they were trained and what they learn. So do you think that the people behind the scenes of the various AIs in a McLuhan sort of sense that the media is the message can persuade lots of people? First of all, that presumes that lots of people are, are using chat GPT or whatever. I don't know what the percentage is right now. Um, is that, is that the fear on the long night scenario is that people, uh, exponentially get more influenced by AI even than they were from social media? Yeah. Um, my bet is that, uh, AI, whether it's chat or visual or whatever, is going to be the interface we're going to use for almost everything. It's going to be in every product, every service It's going to be in the background. Um, and that, uh, a lot of, from a technological kind of standpoint, a lot of the fight that we're seeing now over values is over who gets it to insert their values into these AIs, and uh, a, they call it alignment. Who can align the AI to their value set? Um, who's allowed to? And um, it's a big fight, you know. And I, what will happen is, I mean, you're going to have AI tutors for your kids, right? And and people don't think that. That'll happen, but it will happen because these AI tutors are going to be better than any teacher that you could possibly have at school. Could, could at you tell school. the AI tutor, I don't want any subjective uh, opinions. I just want what's demonstrable by science taught to my kids, or is that just <laughs> I don't think that's going to be useless. possible. No, I mean, it, really? it, I, I'd rather see, that's why I've been pushing and I've been advocating for open source AIs uh, and that... Uh, you know, if they're borrowing and taking all this data, my data, your data, and everybody else's data to build these things, and they're incredibly valuable, this should at least open the code so we can see what's going on. And that uh, I I think that if people have access to the op these open source alternatives, they, they will be able to use those to maintain a, a degree of sovereignty. But if it's all dictated from, from wh whoever is able to align everything, um, you're not going to have any choice in, in in how your kids are raised and uh, you know, how things are roll out globally. So, so things, and you use tutoring as, as one example, but things like that will be so cheap and easy that it will almost be the default path for all industries. I mean, how, I want to I 
drill down on that, but how sure. do you feel now looking at what's happening with AI versus 28 years ago when you were the first internet analyst? Is there a parallel? Is this a totally different deal? No, it feels relatively similar. Um, I mean, there's an incredible amount of activity and a lot of people are working on a lot of different elements and in different ways to apply it. Um, and I've used the tool and, and I subscribe to it and it's, it's, it's amazingly useful and, 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 um, good at what it does. And, um, I, I, I see it's going to be used in just about everything. It's just, it's just almost inevitable. Let, let me ask you a self-serving sure. qu question. Um, I'm worried about a lot of things <clears throat> about AI, um, warfare, uh, being one, uh, AGI and, uh, another, a big one is that will make things more efficient on all scales and therefore acts as a larger straw on, uh, the natural systems of earth ecological wise. But I am an educator and my role as a podcast host and a video purveyor and, uh, trying to do a reality 101 eight hour series of videos for young people, uh, early in 2024. Is AI going to replace uh, people like me and podcasts like me? And how would that happen? I, I've never, I, I didn't plan on asking you that. And I've never thought about it till, till this second. But what are your thoughts on that? Um, it will replace you if you don't use them to leverage yourself. So hmm. you won't be doing exactly the same thing you're doing. You'll use it to make it easier to produce what you produce. Uh, and um, you'll do it faster and you'll do it with higher quality and you'll do it with more um, more interaction and, and, and more things that you could do. But if you don't adapt to that, it's like, you know, people who didn't get on the internet or people who didn't adopt computers early on, it's just, it's going to be tougher for, if you don't leverage it. So that that's from a presentation of snazzy looking, uh, videos and seamless transitions and colorful things. But the the real special sauce uh, i don't know if you watch my podcast i do these mm. franklies where i kind of go for a bike ride and i think about the the connections between the disciplines and how they fit together and the ai can't access my brain they can only access the things i've said in the past sure so can ai really replace how i think and the inferences um that i oh. make to to help people understand our situation Okay, well, I, I do think that AIs will be increasingly able to model you, okay? And and so right now, just based on all of my, I had like 20 years of writing on Global Gorillas, that blog, and um, what I've done on Twitter and everything else, and it sucked it all in. I think it even got my book in. Um, it can write posts in my voice. And it can compare and contrast me or my ideas against other thinkers like I did it against Boyd the other day, and it was pretty, pretty darn good. Um, Wait, I can take you asked topic. AI to compare your own thinking to Boyd's thinking? Yeah, it did a great job. Wow. And that uh, if I have a new topic that I haven't really written about and I uh, ask it to speak in my voice or write an essay in my voice, it does a pretty good job. Um, if I set it up with the right kind of uh, questions, it can, it can um, not just replicate me, but uh, you know, if I, if I set up my question in the right way, it can dig into topics that I haven't seen anyone write about yet. I mean, really complex topics that, you know, I, I wasn't, I, I would have been able to find anything that, that was similar online, which is awesome. I mean, it, so it does a pretty darn good job. I, long, long term, I do think though, that we're going to be modeled. I mean, you've heard the simulation hypothesis, haven't you? Um, yes. S simula and simulacrum that, uh, please yeah. explain it. Well, okay, the physicists all think in terms of you know physic modeling physical reality at the at the computational level. Me, I, I'm you know more open to the idea that they would model human beings in our experience, which is a very you know much lighter computational load in order to uh, create people that are similar. They did something on Westworld recently that that was similar to that is that uh, but you can do it much faster in a in a kind of a simulated online environment and that uh, if there are minds that you want to recreate you'd run them through a, a bunch of simulations to create that mind 
and then you could ask it questions <laughs> within its environment and that you want solved. So the potential is that we're not actually in reality, but we're actually in living in, we're doing this interview in one of those simulations. Um, given the computational power and the ease of simulation, the number of potential simulations that could be run in the next 20 to 30 years, um, it's very unlikely this is the actual si reality. It's more likely that what we're doing right now is within one of those simulations, one of those 99.99999% chance that that's that we're living in a simulated environment. Yeah, I it's kind of scary. That. Yeah, no. It, well, it, of course, the immediate and it's scary, gonna, and I don't buy it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But but that is what inspired the movie The Matrix, right? Uh, not not really. I think The Matrix was kind of a funky thing. Is that they do? They just created the simulated reality that they all these batteries. Human humans were used as a battery for the machine and they would just live in the simulator what i'm talking about is like simulating a person's life because you want and you know recreate an einstein and you take every bit of data that you have on them and try to simulate those experiences such that when 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 you finish that simulation that mind is as close to the real einstein as you hoped so the the more you actually put on more you put online the easier it is to simulate people Oh, I have so many questions now, John. First of all, oh, uh, uh, well, this is kind of a tangent, but okay, sure. Uh, well, no, go ahead. Yeah, it's it's a tangent to your to your core work, but I think it it's central, and I haven't had anyone on the the show uh, other than maybe Daniel Schmachtenberger that understands this stuff. Einstein and Nate Hagen's um, what is online is high graded. Uh, I'm talking about my thoughts about the world. I'm not talking, I, I'm not uploading, uh, th my problems or, uh, you know, all the things that I'm not sharing publicly. So AI would only access a tiny part of the larger self of me. And the same with Einstein. He's not writing equations about his personal life and sure. some of the other things he cares about. So AI would only focus on a, a certain aspect, right? Right. Yeah. No, it, it, it's harder pre-internet, pre-network. And um, as we continue to upgrade the network and it becomes more intrusive in our lives and more, you know, with us all the time and monitoring us and, and um, kind of acting as data collection, it, it, it'll collect enough data that it makes it easier and easier and easier to do. Um, but, you know, I suspect that everything you've written on Twitter and everything else, you know, it's going to be poured over by AI historians looking for, you know, iconoclastic minds or minds that could be useful in coming up with unusual answers to, to questions. Um, and that uh, you'll pull, they'll pull individuals they want to re recreate and minds they want to recreate. And um, of course, relatives could do it and other people who want to see that person again. But um, more likely, you know, if you want them, get unusual answers to um, difficult problems, uh, you want to create those people again. So so some of the episodes on Black Mirror were not such science fiction after all, perhaps. Correct. I mean, that was written based on the earlier philosophies of this stuff or the thinking on this stuff by Bostrom and others. But um, So there's a, a pejorative term in our culture called a Luddite or a neo-Luddite, someone that's kind of against technology. I think if everyone understood, like everyone, 330 million Americans, understood right. and believed the last 10 minutes of this conversation, that a lot of people would want no part of that. Um, right. But are they going to be forced into it? Is it going to be uh, a compulsion either fear of being left out or um some top-down necessity uh like skynet or some of the things in the movies are we going to have a demographic in society that can choose to walk away from all this stuff or is that not going to be possible you know like a uh, when a, if, a, if a human body got close to a black hole the gravity on the head would be just a little bit more than the gravity on your feet and that it would stretch you out into this line of molecules so we're I'll, kind I'll of take in your that, word on that yeah no it ends up that the you'll just have a line of molecules as they proceed into the black hole is that um 
we're kind of in that kind of situation in society with technology. I mean, as these things start to roll out, as we start to get augmented reality and selective reality, and then you get AIs and AIs as companions and AIs as accelerants, um, tutors, um, is that a certain subgroup is going to pull away and they're going to be people at various stages all the way down to people who are disconnected. And it's going to be harder to make money in the disconnected and 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 lower strata of that. Um, more likely to be automated, more likely to be replaced, uh, more likely to just be used for their data production, because every single work, every single job that you have, uh, everyone going forward is going to be a data uh, strip mining effort by your employer. They're going to be they're going to be sucking your data and feeding it into systems either to get paid for it or to put into a system that they control in order to replace you. Who so, owns all that data? Well, that's the thing that we didn't fix. I, I went in front of the Senate a couple of years ago and about social networks and data and how this all works. And um, it was just before OpenAI hit. And I said, we have to get this data thing right because data is becoming the new oil. It's becoming so important. And it's going to be used. All these social networks are accumulating it, Google included, to build AIs. And people are like, oh, yeah, it's not going to have or happen. But what we need to do is make sure that people have data ownership, just as a core right. Is that uh, otherwise, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be like serfs who are going to be contributing our labor for free to the to the to the uh, the nobles and and feudal feudal landlords, and um, our data will be strip mined and excavated, and we'll get no benefit in creating what these AIs are going to be the most valuable technological artifacts we've ever created. And built off of our data, and we don't have any equity stake in their in their uh, in their value. Um, they're just saying, that, "Hey, we'll give the, we'll give you cheap services um, or relatively cheap services based on these AIs, and that's the payment you get for contributing the data that that produce these." Um, open AI wouldn't have been possible without strip mining our data. So many questions. Well, what about I've read that um, some of these big AIs or the the firms that control them actually manufacture big data that they don't need John Robb or Nate Hagen's data that they create their own data and then run AI on that. How does that fit in? Yeah, there's, there's a, a new method that they're working on to create synthetic data. Problem with that is, um, it's going to end up being biased in the direction. It's going to new data. That's going to see the beauty of the original large language models. Uh, the original uh, is that they initially focused on just getting uh, predicting the next word or next sentence, and as they crunched it down, as they um, compressed it, is that they found that it actually did this at the conceptual level too. They basically created a world model for our abstract space, and um, it's a raw conceptual model of of our civilization's abstract space. And um, they won't let anyone have any access to it. <laughs> what they ended up doing then is trying to reinforce behaviors that they kind of driving it insane. To, so we'll have outputs that are constrained within certain limits. Um, and I think the synthetic data is going to end up doing that too. If you, if you don't have enough data in that's right and good, well, let's let's create it synthetically and then feed it into the model and train it so it biases in the direction that you're. You're hoping it goes. So they so they I'm have seventy percent of a of a um a, a a dossier on Nate Hagen's and the thirty percent that's missing they create using synthetic data, but it's biased on their own objectives and so that profile and how they steer well, it is then biased. Yeah, I mean, there isn't any kind of objective reality when it comes to AI output in terms of valuing it. It's all based on what we like. That's the beauty. That's the hidden secret about AIs is that they're, we don't fund, we don't put money into, we don't put training dollars into, or training um, GPUs into building AIs that produce stuff that we don't like, we don't value. They're kind of beholden to us. That's they're we, it, we it's as a built -in individuals. Cycle. We as we individuals as or we as the as a, okay as a mass market. Um, if we're not willing to pay for it and not willing to use it, um, they won't build it. They won't train it. They won't to do that. So um, the more they go off on tangents, the more they go in the direction of synthetic data, the synthetic data may not uh, 
reflect our wants and needs and they could end up um, creating a model that we don't use and don't like. Getting back to your, uh, the warfare uh, topic, sure. um, as we head into difficult times because of uh, physical limits and looking inward, et cetera, is it possible that AI will then catalog the, the political views and uh, ideologies and historical statements by mining everything someone said on their Twitter or Facebook or whatever, and that looking back that that itself is a modern version of the SS or, or some, uh, you know, social police. Is, is that something you worry about? Oh, yeah, that's that's that long night scenario is that okay. we that the corporations have built a surveillance state. Um, if they switch it on, that would make all the surveillance states we've ever seen in the past look like tea parties. <laughs> it's it's not even close. It they would require those old states required rooms and rooms and rooms of, of bureauc uh, bureaucrats sitting at desk pouring over documents and other th this right. thing could this thing this a these AIs can monitor, cajole, persuade uh, a billion or more people simultaneously in real time. This is not a, that's that's where we're headed is that I would rather not see this so centralized because networks tend to centralize. You know, the whole Metcalf's law, right? Is that yes. the value but, of a network is, is square the number of nodes. And, and, and so a network that's big is so much more valuable than two networks that are like a half half the size it's not like additive um so we tend to centralize networks and um, and, and that's I, why I, everyone is competing to get the best ai because the best ai will win out a, a, a against all the others it, it'll just yeah there'll be maybe one or two and they'll destroy everybody and then there'll be the chinese ais and there'll be a couple of them and then and nobody else will get anything and europe is turning off data accumulation they're basically allowing people to destroy it and so they're going to be left out and become technologically impoverished so um, so wait a minute so, so europe is is in effect listening to your advice saying that oh, data no. ownership they're going exactly they're going for privacy so privacy destroys data it blocks it doesn't let it accumulate doesn't feed it, the ais that will customize experiences and products and services both as a seller of those and as a receiver of those so europe is is turning themselves into a kind of a technological backwater. It's like banning cars. Okay. <laughs> it's like, we like our horses. You know, you're going to fall farther and farther and farther behind. Data ownership is that I should have a royalty. I should have some say over how my data is used. I want robust markets. I want a financial market equivalent for data. For when I give data, you know, you, you know, you extract data from me at work or, or if, if if AIs who are on Twitter or any other of the networks I'm using, and they use that data to build a, an AI, um, I want a, a level of veto power over it, but I also want to make some money on it. If that thing ends up becoming the most valuable thing you know, of that year, I want to have an equity stake in it. And I think if I had companies, you know, basically uh, firms with a fiduciary duty to actually get me my best deal, and get you your best deal and get all of us our best deals because we pool our data together to do this. I think that uh, would give us a much better system long term than a system that's based on extraction alone. Okay, now I'm confused because sure. if that happens, um, you said that AI is following the dictates of us, broader society, which right now we are turning billions of barrels of ancient sunlight into microliters of dopamine and convenience uh, and short-term stimulation and comfort, et cetera. And if all of a sudden there's a boost in productivity, um, we're gonna consume more, but we're gonna get a rebate because uh, our data is responsible for part of that. Isn't that just a, a, a huge positive feedback draw on energy resources and the environment? I mean, training more AIs that chew up the electricity of a major city. Uh, well, well not only training. that, but the 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 consumptive path. Um, oh, I, 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 yeah. I, well, I I I do see a shift, and um, I think it'll be more forcible than it should be. Is that people will start to consume more virtual goods. So once you get to AR, and that's really really close, 
I mean, you know, 2007 is when the first smartphone came out. It, by 2021, uh, 5 billion people were using, right? So it's, it's possible that in 15 years, we're going to see people using augmented reality that will change their visual field, their auditory field selectively, as well as augmenting it and adding things. In. And if you want to decorate your home, you won't buy Martha Stewart's package in the store at Walmart. You're going to do it visually using that. Uh, it, it, you could share it with the rest of the family and anyone who visits. So you wouldn't be buy the physical goods. There would be this virtual good, which is a fraction, fraction of, of the energy cost, inherent energy cost associated with, with buying a good. And then also um, I, I might have an augmented reality experience of going to the Bahamas instead of actually flying there as one example. Oh yeah. It would make it instantaneous. You could be anywhere. Effectively, uh, you know, the reason why we didn't, everyone always said, you know, technology is not advancing and the, you know, airline travel is an example of why that hit the wall or that hitting the wall that it's not doubling or improving. And I'm going, it just shifted, it shifted when you start to do telephone calls using video and, and you get more immersive audio and, um, you're getting 80, 90% of the visit for that meeting in, in Paris that you would be if you were there. Um, and that's so much cheaper that you're opting for that. Now, when you get to the fully immersive, then you don't miss any of it. You're instantaneously everywhere. That feels which is, a little like the matrix to me. Uh, well, it's, I mean, Augmented reality is different than uh, virtual reality. Virtual reality is this gaming fantasy world, right? Okay. And augmented reality is this world plus digital enhancement. And if you visit me in this world, you're in my living room with me, uh, talking to me as if you were physically there. Um, only thing I can't do is touch you. Which you know that's the Except that's the only your, barrier. You, your physical reality might look like a scene from Sanford and Son, but your augmented reality looks like the perfect color and backdrop and cool. And it ass. gets it, yeah, it gets crazy really quickly. But it's like um, I think there will be kind of norms and standards developed so we can converse and interact. Uh, because I can change, for instance, I could go down the street and I can like, change what everyone looks like using augmented reality. I get to put in a costume because you're because you're wearing some sort of goggles or something. Yeah, I mean, oh, okay. So augmented reality is is that you'll have either contacts or glasses that can modify your visual environment, um, either subtracting things or changing things. I could do day to night, night to day, um, that kind of thing. You've been ahead of the curve on these tech issues, which was one of the reasons oh, yeah. I I invited you on the program. I, I normally wouldn't cover this topic, but how likely, what sort of odds, given all the other crap going on in the world that you're aware of, how likely is the scenario that you just described to be our reality in the next 10 or 15 years? I mean, augmented reality and selective yeah. reality, that kind of thing where you get, shoot, you even look at the AirPods you have right now can be selective. It can mute everything except for the person talking to you. So that's just an example of it's already rolling out. And the, the first kind of, um, AR VR high-end stuff is coming from Apple early next year, maybe a year after that or so. And then once it hits, it's going to be like crack. 15 years, 5 billion people, easy. It's going to be addictive. Last week, uh, I interviewed Art Berman um, and his podcast will air before yours does. And he's quite confident that we are now passing uh, because of declining well productivity in the shale uh, fields that right. peak oil is now in the past and it's not going to be a steep decline based on geology. There's above ground factors with wars and other things that might impact it, but we're going to have less oil going forward uh, in, in the future, almost for sure. Um, how do you view um, AI and some of the things you've been talking about with respect to both limits to growth and uh, declining energy uh, quality and energy availability of the kind that we've we've used up until now? Yeah, that's the tough one. As we're more restricted in the future, our traditional economic growth path is 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 limited. There are 3 billion people clamoring to become part of the middle class that's now increasingly un unattainable. And um, 
it's going to make everything even tighter. I mean, just the last 20 years with just the, the China and the other people entering the middle class, putting strain on the whole system, uh, both you know from climate to, to resources, um, is that as this kind of virtual environment starts to uh, emerge, I, I do see a big push to get people to start moving towards replacing physical goods with virtual goods, yeah. virtual experiences. And that attempt is to um, ride the ener energy, energy efficiency gains you get from computation. It's like Kumi's law. Uh, it's like uh, every, every couple of years, it becomes twice as energy efficient to deliver the same compute. So um, is to just increasing, I mean, it doesn't take much bandwidth and, and much manipulation of experiences to fill up our whole sensory matrix. Um, so, you know, if, if we start replacing that, then we're become more and more vulnerable to AI, more and more vulnerable to um, manipulation and control, uh, you know, especially if tied to a centralized kind of system. Um, we get tied into a, a narrow orthodoxy and a way of looking at the world that uh, is imposed on us. And, and that's just evolutionary death and, and collapse. So um, that's the reason why I was pushing for space earlier, is that unless we start going out and changing this dynamic from everything, from energy to resources to, to the way we look at the world and, and beyond, um, we're in this collapsing dynamic that's not going to end well for us at all. But it's a, a decline is different than a collapse. I mean, we could have half to two thirds of what we have today, and maybe there's a smaller population, and maybe we have less resources per capita, and maybe we still have some complexity. And I, I mean, it, it's not. Well, I, I don't think I don't think it's a collapsing complexity in that sense. Is that um, which, which is always potentially possible because of a collapsing complexity from the most complex portions of the civilization is, is, would be catastrophic. Most people can't even grow anything. Right. Um, is that the, the system will become more and more domineering and more controlling in order to maintain order and structure as, uh, the physical world diminishes. And that's not, that could go on for a long, long time. Um, are order and structure about to be uh, about to leapfrog economic growth um, and more GDP as kind of the generator function of elites in con in in charge? Like right now, well, we're optimizing GDP kind of as our cultural goal, and AI and corporations are underneath that. But I'm wondering how the the whole authoritarian um, control dynamic is going to unfold if if what you're saying is true well i mean you already see it kind of on the edges right so the environmental movement is is more about control and structure um all of the dai stuff is control and structure it's imposed it's based on alignment uh, you must comply it doesn't really matter if you don't make more money it must be done um i mean disney lost more than half its value doing that so it's like it's a uh, it's already happening, and um, you know, I mean, just the in the economic sense, our system is is if it doesn't continue to grow, um, to handle, it won't be able to handle the debt load. And, Correct. You know, th yeah, that kind of environment after that will be very dire and slow, and 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 a grinding existence. And I think people will. I, I've called that the, the great simplification, John. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. And and. You know what happens when you you know you don't have access to the things you used to is that people move to the things that they get access to for very inexpensively, which is this virtual stuff. Um, um, I mean, you go anywhere in the world right now, you, you know, even the poorest places, people have those smartphones. They're connected. Yeah. You go in the Niger Delta, people have three different services they're connected to, and three different right. phones depending on which ones have connectivity at the time. And the same thing is going to happen to uh, augmented reality. It's it's an ultimate escape. It's the ultimate way of controlling your you know your experiences in the world. Um, and if you don't do it in a positive way, a productive way, a, a way that's you know moving you and society forward, um, it's going to be used to distract you. And 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 who's going to be pulling the 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 strings there? Um, the the control levers. Is it corporations and billionaires, or governments, or some combination? 
corporations for the most part <clears throat> with some government input, but most of those government input is um, on behalf of you know network right. tribes that are kind of wanting certain things at certain levels of alignment. Um, no, it's a it's a very very small group. We've sent the funny thing is that, that we 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 won against communism because of their centralized decision making system. You know, our decentralized system was more innovative over time and more productive. It was able to solve problems, and that once we defeated communism and ended the Cold War, we globalized and financialized, and that financialization returned us to a central, created a centralized system again. Is where very few people make most of the decisions about everything that goes on, and um, and they don't make good decisions. They don't make investments like you and I. I mean. All the billionaires I know, it's more I want to hedge my stuff, or I want to gamble wildly. <laughs> That's and, my experience. And there's no too. in between. <laughs> yeah, there's no in between. There's no like, oh, I want to invest in this, so it has a you know long term payout. The only kind of anomaly of in that space is uh, to extent Bezos and uh, of course Musk. Musk is a complete anomaly. Yeah, um, that he invests in the long term. So um, it's it's. It's weird and and kind of nerve wracking to see so much riding on Musk, so much of the future, from electrification of cars to the you know to the autonomous driving to just all of space. Space was dead, and he revived it. And, um, and his potential to actually push that out and and actually make that uh, a viable frontier for us again, expansionary frontier, is. Um, there's a lot to write on on one relatively unstable guy, you know. It's a uh, and he's under deeply pressure from involved in uh, in AI, presumably as well. Oh, he's got an AI coming, so he's got the he's got Grok, which is his AI built off Twitter data, and and um, you know that's going to be another piece of this whole thing. Where and he's going to open source it. So if you want to use that in order to teach your kids or you know work as your assistant or work with you and help you augment your life, uh, you'll know what it's doing and how to change it and how to modify it. Because most of these open source AIs, you can get mods for them that point them in certain directions. Um, they're not dictated to you. Here's a question I didn't anticipate sure. asking you. Um, okay. There's the factual implications of what you're saying and people need to educate themselves and learn and make choices. But the emotional implications of what you're saying are are really depressing and disheartening. And like people are already worried about climate change and resource depletion and the end of growth and other things. And now I, I think my sense, and I'm I have a podcast, but I'm just kind of a normal guy in the Midwest, and the people I talk to have no idea of the things you're talking about. Oh yeah, and, I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah, no, you, this is your expertise. You don't need to apologize, but this, I think this is like a really depressing, um, uh, load to put on someone about the future. It's like what this too. And I just wonder how humanities, uh, we, we already have, I don't know what percentage of our population, but a lot who are mentally ill and how is this going to fit in with that? It just seems like a another uh a sisyphean boulder to push up yeah no no if if, if cancer was the 20th century disease mental illness the 21st century I mean, we're just at the cusp of, of the mental illness that we're going to run into i mean there'll be people that are so divorced from reality based on these new tech it's going to be i mean we're already seeing a little bit of it but we're well, look at, look at like Jonathan Haidt was on my podcast and now sure. the last month or two, he's been tweeting a lot on how having TikTok and phones for 13, 14, 15 year olds is directly impacting their mental health in terrible ways. And that those schools that don't allow the phones at all have better outcomes with the students and their mental health and all that. What you're saying with augmented reality and AI it's going to be all that stuff on steroids, right? Oh yeah, hundred percent. Though I, I I do think you can raise your kids in a way that mitigates the damage that they'll experience from these online and technological experiences. Because my, you know my two youngest, they're Gen Z, and um, now they have great jobs and they're the most stable, productive people I've ever 
I've ever run across. Uh, I mean, granted, there's a lot of wackos that they have to deal with that are in their generation, but man, they're just, wow, what people. What do, what do you they attribute do tech that tech. to? They use TikTok. They use all of that stuff. It's um, it's maybe uh, knowing what they're experiencing. I mean, I get into TikTok. I use it. I use Twitter. I use all everything. I, you know, I can uh, talk to them about how to approach technology and how to approach stuff. Um, I've been counseling them on, on not becoming too political, trying to stay outside the phrase that this is also tribal now. Uh, you know, people see an incident in a country far, far from them that they're not related to in any way in, in, the, in the physical world, but they're treating it like, you know, somebody killed their mother, right? And um, you got to avoid that stuff. You got to back off. And, um, because, like because right not, not only, I mean, there's going to be that stuff every month of, oh, yeah. in coming years, everywhere. Oh, yeah. And yeah. TikTok's full of that stuff. I mean, that's the big war right now is trying to rein in TikTok because the TikTok anti-Israel effort right now uh, is so big. It's not that it's disinformation. It's just, it, 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 it just making the case that, you know, Israel is the apartheid state. You have to get rid of them. And the amount of people that are, are seeing that makes it, it's, it's more than all of the networks, all of the newspapers combined every day. Is, is this what you refer to in your writing as tribal moral warfare? Correct. Yeah. There's a tribal moral war underway, um, over Israel. And there's one that was over, um, Russia and invasion of U Ukraine. Um, you know, I saw the kind of internal politics, moral warfare going on with BLM, and I was projecting that it would go global and probably hit Israel first. But um, when I wrote well, you about were right. it in 2021, I wrote about it that it was going to hit Israel uh, and um, Ukraine hit before that. So it was like that was our first over escalation of a conflict. It brought us to a new Cold War based on network amplification alone. And now with Israel, um, they've lost the under 40s in the United States. They're 80% against Israel right now. They're not going to change. Um, uh, and the U.S. is going to take a big hit in legitimacy with those younger younger people because we've sided Even with Even though they Israel. live in the U.S.? Yeah. Oh, well, U.S. support for Israel is essential to their survival. Yeah, there's no there's no way around it, and it uh, they've lost it online. Um, those kids, anyone, people under fifty, do not watch TV. They do not watch. They barely read the newspapers. They get most of their wait, stuff wait secondhand. Pe people under fifty don't watch TV generally. Oh, TV TV news. So the, oh. generally, the TV news audience on any given night is say seven million people. One out of those seven million. Is under fifty-five. All the rest one, are one, one million. On, out one of million seven out million. of seven million okay. people total viewers is under fifty-five. So, and then when the kids watch it, I've seen kids react to the kind of nightly news stuff uh, coverage of, of this war. They go nuts. They can't believe how stupid it is and how terrible it was, and it was like so misleading and but da, da 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 da. And it really wasn't that good, but. Boy, the reaction is, is is decidedly negative. My my mom's eighty three and she watches nightly news uh, twice. She'll watch it again an hour later, and I don't understand it. But um, I digress. Um, I, I, how I don't watch any TV. I, I haven't had a TV since nineteen ninety nine, John. Yeah, me me too. And and I used to delineate people like at a party. You could kind of tell who watched TV and who not. There was an alertness. Uh, I don't I don't know. It's, it's changed now because I do have a computer, so I watch Netflix and, and whatever else. Right, right. So it's not quite the same, but um, uh, how are we as humans who care about the collective future and our own personal and family and community future, how are we going to know what's true or not going forward? Not, not only with social media, but now with AI. And, and, and are we uh, going to naturally self-assemble into networked tribes that are stronger than the truth? Already we're seeing that the online, uh, news sausage machine is upstream of the conventional 
traditional media. So how it, how they approach it downstream is usually determined online first. You could actually see it's like a pipeline. And, um, you know, the more I look at this, the less it is about disinformation, it, the more it is about how that information is interpreted. Mm. So, um, you know, when somebody says, well, Israel's conducting genocide, you disagree, but it isn't like, it isn't like a factually wrong ap- on an absolute level. It's a, mm. a disagreement in interpretation. Um, and that, uh, and what you do and how you act and, and how you respond to what's going on is based on that interpretation and that's being fought over. Um, so uh, there's a big battle over who, what interpretation, what values are being put into place to uh, you know make your interpretation win. And so the, you know, big effort to get the networks to um, the social networks to enforce a, a standard whereby anyone who says anything different is screened out and blocked and, and isn't seen at all. John, let me ask you this. What, what do you, um, you obviously are, are wide and deep on, on a lot of these subjects. What's your day like? Like, are you thinking about all this stuff? Or are you constantly finding new information on what's going on in the world? Or like, how, how do you make your own sense making of the world as you, as a routine? Yeah, I've set up my network so I can scan them pretty efficiently. So I have a pretty diverse set of um, feeds that allow me to see what's going on in every single different quadrant of the political spectrum. So uh, I'm not like being totally blindsided by by something uh, happening in an area that I was politically blind to. You know what I mean? Like for instance, in 2016, watching what the Hillary folks on Facebook were saying and what the Trump people were saying, being able to see both sides as as they're working it up. And the same thing with all the information silos that are out there. But um, for the most part, uh, I'm looking for just very specific things to pop up. And um, when it pop when they pop up, it kind of fits in. Oh, here's here's this framework that I wasn't able to actually invest in yet because it was still speculative. It's not speculative anymore because now I can see evidence of it actually happening. It means it's potentially predictive. Therefore, I should write about it. And how I write about it and how I kind of get this, it requires a lot of subconscious kind of grinding. So I'll play games and I'll read books and. Um, interact with my family and that kind of stuff. And I let it grind in my background and subconscious. And then when it gets right, then I write it. That That's exactly how I do my Franklies and, and some of my videos. There's this subconscious grinding that happens when I'm with my ducks or on a bike ride or, or something. I'm not even yep. thinking about it. So it's like happening in the background. Um, so getting back to the the Israel situation and Ukraine and others, um, some one of the, your themes that you've written about is something called fictive kinship. And um, could you explain what that is? I assume it's that as our, our ancestors, we lived in small hunter-gatherer tribes and who was genetically related to us, we cared about them immensely for evolutionary natural selection reasons. But now the internet has given us the feeling that we're related to people halfway around the world, even though we're not. Yeah, I mean, initially it was just the clan unit, which is blood relations. And then to get to the tribe unit, which get you at a couple hundred people, you had to create this story that and 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 a set of rituals and other things that created a, a bond of fictive kinship with these other people. Um, and that they were like blood relations mm-hmm. and that you're going to be with them forever. And they're part of your tribal family. And that um, when that didn't fully go away it was just changed over time as we moved into become nation states and and patriotism and and nationalism is a form of that kind of tribal bond but it's a kind of a diluted and 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 version of it uh yet we still kill based on it right patriotism gets people to join up um but um in the online environment uh there are mechanisms to hack the way we think about things and if you uh, we are very vulnerable to what I call empathy triggers is that if you, you don't have any of the defenses that we would have in the offline environment, 
So if you see somebody being attacked, like say George Floyd with a knee on his neck, and you're watching that video, you feel that knee on your neck to a certain extent. Their empathy is not um, mm. sympathy. It's a it's, it's a, a forcible neurons. Yeah, and it, it mirrors their mental state, and it's forcible, and is you know it, it can be involuntary, and, and then you're super mad at the at the cop, and you're very uh, connected. You're it, you're, uh, you create this bond of fictive kinship with the victim, and if you see a, a Israeli kid getting killed, or you know the, the or you see a Palestinian kid getting killed, you, know, you can create that bond of fictive kinship, and um, that creates that kind of tribal connection that makes you uh, rationally angry about that war that's thousands of miles away. Um, enough so that you know. Like that landlord in, in outside Chicago, they went down and you know stabbed to death that kid, that that Palestinian kid that used to, you know, play in the treehouse he built for him, and just because he was Palestinian, he was, he was exercised over it. It's um, so um, presumably you could be exposed and influenced to, in a fictive kinship sort of way by seeing, uh, by having empathy towards an Israel uh, kid that got killed. But then an hour later, you could have uh, the same reaction to a Palestinian kid getting killed. Um, so presumably, who is biasing or controlling the social media or the AI uh, that is in our feeds is responsible for triggering and creating that empathy? Or is the AI itself uh, you know, optimizing for clicks and for emotional response, therefore presented in such a way. Uh, how do you fit all that together? Well, right now, uh, at least on X and TikTok, uh, you can come at it from any different direction. So you could see both, but what ends up happening is once you've created that bond of fictive kinship with one, and it's usually tied to your friend group and other people that are reinforcing that view, is that you won't see the other. And there's a lot of reasons why you'll start to screen out uh, any atrocity by your, you know, the side that you are tacitly supporting. Um, it's that tribal dynamic. Um, and you start to adopt the kind of patterns uh, of, of, of sorting and sifting through information in order to support that tribal narrative. Do you sift it out consciously or does your feed sift it out automatically? Increasingly, it tends to be the feed reinforces it. For most people, okay, and so, and then you know it, it'll put it in front of you, and then expect you to like it or to you know agree with it. Um, and you, you know, you've ever, you've felt that tension when you saw a post from somebody in you know that's close to you in your feed, and um, you couldn't post, you couldn't respond to it because it just if you did, things would blow up. And um, well, that's kind of that's kind of the the dynamic here is that uh, now. Granted, you know, if you control the network, you could control what people are seeing, and you could amplify um, only one kind of sediment. Um, we had a little bit of that at the beginning of the Ukraine war. You know, you know, anyone who wasn't <clears throat> a pro-Ukraine, trying to isolate Russia, anti-Russia, create a new Cold War, push, 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 was marginalized and attacked. Aggressively. Tell me about it. That's why I didn't really talk about that as much as I would have liked to last year. And I'm afraid oh, yeah. that I'm going to be able to increasingly talk about less and less. I think speaking truth to power generally is going to be fraught with peril in the next 24, 36 months. Right. You know, I, I pointed out really early on that this wasn't the kind of rational leadership of a, of a we need in a nuclear world. Um, it was very the impulsive kind of reactive leadership of a networked world, but it was running up against nuclear realities and that we needed to take a breather and figure out what we're doing and, and not provoke this. I mean, don't let them send drones into Moscow. Don't let them, yeah, that kind of thing that, that would potentially lead to a nuclear incident that would end the world. And you know, so many people were like, from March onward, it's like attack, attack, attack. No such thing as nuclear war. It's not going to happen. If if Putin does it, it's going to you know prove everything we said about him is true. I go, that doesn't matter to me. <laughs> if he, yeah. You know, it will, if we're it won't matter to it, anyone if it happens. Yeah. Yeah. If nuke lands in New York City and every everything in between that in LA, we're, it doesn't really matter. So, so let, let's drill down on that. Um, how does networked tribalism, which is the broad category of what you're describing here, 
right. um, and in some combination with AI, how worried are you about a, a nuclear exchange a, as a result of that in, in the coming decade? Well, we came pretty close, closer than a lot of people would admit. Um, I agree. You mean yeah, recently that, even? Yeah, no. Yeah, with the, uh, and there's continually, you know, incidents that are potentially could be misinterpreted because those drones hitting Moscow look a lot like uh, cruise missiles. <laughs> could, <laughs> could alert the wrong thing and then set off the wrong kind of response. But um, so the response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, went not so fast because there was already a network that, a tribal network that was in place fighting Trump. And Putin was, yeah. you know, blamed for Trump's election in, in 2016 by that crowd. Even though they, his influence was marginal, it he was blamed as the ultimate evil in that instance. He installed Trump in our, and, and caused all the misery of, 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 of Trump's reign of terror, <laughs> according to them. So uh, when Putin invaded, they went nuts. They went like, this is the worst thing ever. It's like, he's going to take all of Europe, da, 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 da. Hitler re reborn. We have to fight him. And that got amplified on the network. And it just went insane to the point where everyone was disconnecting Russia, corporations across the board, uh, people kicking Russians out of discussion groups. It was like, we went to embargo effectively from the West to Russia, um, which is like one step away from tactical nuclear use, according at least the, the uh, nuclear ladder of Khan. I'm going to ask uh, a specific um, Russia-Ukraine uh, military question in a second, mm -hmm. but this networked tribalism and this response that you just described, and sure, there's right. Ukraine-Russia, you mentioned an Israel example. There's lots of potential examples. Is there any way to combat that? If we can, if we can anticipate that that is a risk for society, this networked tribalism, which is going to be on steroids with AI in the near future. I mean, you mentioned owning your own data, but like, is this cat out of the bag? Is has the horse left the barn in in this risk? Well, they could put in circuit breakers. How and, so? Uh, you know, well, um, when sentiment for war or violence. Uh, is spreading very, very quickly, you can slow it down, deamplify it during those initial weeks. So you won't get as outside, you know, outsized response. Um, slow it, down the except amplify the triggers. people that are in control of this stuff probably don't want, and they, they want to accelerate that response. I don't think the White House even knew what they were doing. They're just riding the wave. Yeah, they, that's they weren't true. thinking. And then the, I mean, the, the, the funny thing is, is that Musk's experience with that is the reason he pushed through and ended up buying Twitter. So, you know, it's like he saw it going nuts and um, he was going, you know, this is dangerous. I really have to take action. Um, and that uh, this network didn't have a sense of mortality because it was a group mind. It was a swarm. Um, and that uh, it was willing to push way up to the edge and beyond. It was maximalist in its goals. Uh, it wouldn't accept any nuance or 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 break in the action. The only thing they would diminish it over would would be inactivity over time or being distracted by another event. So, um, you know, that's that's the way it played out. And he ended up buying Twitter, and I think that gave him it will give him some level of control over that. But TikTok's a different story. So, I've heard that AI um, has increasingly um, uh, actuation potential capacity and that in the example of Ukraine and Russia or anywhere in the world, that you can tell an AI attack um, Russia under these circumstances, these scenarios, and the AI will do it on its own. It will send out the drones under certain capacities and it will do a swarm so that they can't be shot down in some random way. And I don't know if that's true or not, but if that is true and we're headed in that direction, aren't there just countless examples of 
um, AI assisted Archduke Ferdinand <laughs> moments. <laughs> um, well, I ended up writing the Joint Chiefs of Staff concept on autonomous weapons about four or five years ago. They wanted a 20 year lookout and they didn't have any people on staff to do it. They brought me in and I worked out, went through their whatever they had on the available plus made some projections and, and worked out some of the, the kinks and nuances. Um, they were hard over on human control, but uh, at the time, but the reality is, is that uh, autonomy in, in weapons, which is basically AI, um, changes how you're going to use those weapons and, and changes in a bunch of different dimensions. Uh, you could, you could, um, it's like a smart mind. You could have it embed itself somewhere for a long period of time and then act, okay? And and act according to very narrow um, guidelines. Uh, you could have it, uh, you give it a wide variety of different targets that is allowed to hit and then allow it to go out and you can make and adjudicate which ones to attack. Um, it's kind of extension of putting a little a carrot on the, on your target and then firing the missile is just a little bit more varied than that. The most aggressive version would be um, AIs that uh, can understand and execute mission orders. Mission orders are, you know, uh, like the kind of order that Napoleon would write out and give to Marshal Ney and say, "Okay, here's what you I want you to do." It's very short and sweet, and you have a lot of latitude in terms of how you accomplish it. Um, and then you give that AI access to swarms and of different capabilities and um, have it execute the order. Um, now, that's, that's an entirely different thing, especially if you, they can self-provision, if they can uh, embed deeply behind enemy lines. Uh, yeah, that gets, gets, really, gets really wild. One of the concepts I came up with, and I, I, I don't think it was really taken up by many people at least, is that the... the the really big breakthrough idea to, in using autonomous weapons is um, go for a concept called zero day war. Is that uh, you use drones and AIs to, or AI and AIs on drones and, uh, and deeply embed them in the enemy's geography. Like, you know, they screw themselves into the muck of the, every harbor, every river, every forest, every you know, mountain range, there are some drones and they have different kinds of capabilities. And when the day zero of the war happens, the moment it happens, um, they act. They set up uh, area of denial <laughs> right in the middle of the country. You can't fly a plane, you can't drive a vehicle without it being under attack. Uh, they started attacking the systems and bringing them down systemically systematically, uh, and that they self-provision and they acquire their own electricity and other provisions that they need to sustain themselves. And that's a completely different way of warfare is that it makes it possible that once, once that starts, they'll capitulate before you even get your troops even close enough to actually take the, take the, take the locale. Well, maybe people, maybe you only think people didn't listen to you. Maybe they did listen to you. <laughs> Oh yeah, no. There's there's lots of cool things you could do uh, that would probably save a lot of human lives. Is that they had a say they had a a, a silo of space like over the Spratly Islands offside, off the shore of uh, the Philippines, say a hundred miles in circumference or in uh, diameter, and that it's a capture a flag kind of scenario, but you can only use autonomous weapons within that confines. And um, it's the military might and the technological capability of the sides in involved in China, the US just fight it out constantly there to see who has dominance. Um, and uh, that actually kind of a, kind of a, if somebody's, you know, one side is far more dominant than the other in terms of the technology and, and it's a sign to the other side that they actually should back down <laughs> or things oh be gosh. ugly very quickly. That actually makes sense to me. Um, this is, uh, this is all fascinating. I have a couple of hardcore questions for you, and I know that yeah, um, sure. your family is home and, and your dogs want to be fed, so I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Though, to be honest, I'm, I could go another two hours with my questions. But um, what, are, what are the 
what are the odds that we make it through the next 10 or 20 years without a big war involving nukes? It just seems like so many things are pointing in that, uh, that, that, that potential is looms large. Just your yeah. opinion. Yeah. My first thing, uh, the first thing I ever kind of delved into in military strategy was nuclear warfare and, and it's hideously complex. It's all yeah. psychological. It's all in the mind. And, um, I was hoping, you know, that up until a couple of years ago, uh, just before Ukraine, that you know we were, weren't stupid enough to actually stumble into it again. Um, that all of our, our opponents you could actually visit and vacation in at that moment, and uh, that all changed so quickly. Um, showed that we were far less intelligent and and than I ever suspected. So, is there a potential? Chance, I mean, there's a relatively high chance that we we could see a nuclear exchange. Now, hopefully, if if it is, it's limited and it's and it's so horrifying that we react against it. Just like I mean, we, we, we were get lucky an emotional that, reminder of World War II and right. I mean, it may have been morally wrong to bomb Hiroshima and Nagasaki and, and, and to end the war quickly, but we are lucky they did it because that reinforced the horror of nuclear weapons and prevented the wars that followed that would have been fought with them um, and to far more dev devastation. I mean, we were able to navigate a tightrope the whole of the Cold War and, and not trigger a, a nuclear annihilation of, of, of the West or, or of, of the Northern Hemisphere. And um, that's a good thing. I, I just don't think our, our leadership right now is beyond the JV level. <laughs> They're not serious enough people. And and Biden has a little of that, but it's it's kind of scary is that, you know, how prone they are to just jump on the bandwagon. And um I think there is a, like a little bit of sentiment inside at least the US administration that, you know, uh, things were easier when we were in the Cold War. People listened. You know, and you know, if we could return it a little bit to the Cold War, we can get back to that level of stability and and compliance with 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 government mandates and, and things, but that's not did happen and won't happen. This leads to my second question. Um, I've been in a different overlapping realm than you for the last 20 years, looking at the system science of the human predicament, energy resources, environment, behavior, economics, money, geopolitics. And I've concluded that there is one risk and domain that underpins all others, and that is governance and decision-making. And given what you've said on AI and given what you've said on networked tribalism, um, how does a, a leadership or a government go beyond JV level? Um, and especially in the U S how do our decision-making systems, um, avoid the bad feedback loop of, of poor decision-making in, in this world fraught with peril. Do you have any thoughts on that? How does the political leadership in the U S mature? I don't think it does. Um, and, uh, for a bunch of reasons, one is that the problem sets that we're facing are, are so complex that our leadership style and the method of governance is beyond its capabilities. And the classic thing is in a complex environment, you have to try out a lot of different things and you pick the ones that work reinforce them we don't we're more this is the way to do it this is the bureaucracy says this and uh if you don't like it we're going to force you to adopt it um also our system doesn't have any uh opt-in features meaning that it doesn't have any equity participation in the sense that i get benefit for participating in it and, and in a networked world that's important it's actually a requirement um we just kind of assume because you're inside the geographical borders that you will be loyal to it and, and contribute to it. And increasingly you find that people don't, don't think that way. Um, another thing is that we're living, we're seeing a kind of a hollowing out of the old nation state. Um, it's losing a lot of the power that it once had. A uh, classic example, most recently, it's like I lost complete control of the border. Border's gone. It's broken. Um, and that uh, you know, letting 8 million people in over the last three years the size of what the 13th largest state, um, largely almost completely unvetted. Uh, those people are going to disappear. They'll never be seen again once they're now that they're in. Um, 
from all over the world. It's not just you know, uh, Central and South Americans. Um, and a hollow state, it, you know, has the facade of being a you know effective government. It has all the pomp and circumstance. It gets on the phone. It acts like it's in control, but it has no effective control. It doesn't have effective, effective control of the messaging over the borders, over the physical world. It doesn't have really control over its economy because it's all over the map. It's too big to control. Uh, it doesn't have control over its finances because it's increasingly broke. Um, best we could hope for it, you know it. it like a, a historical counterpart to where we're at is kind of like going back to the 18, late 1800s, 1880 to you know the kind of end of the golden age kind of time frame, and where you're you know high levels of foreign-born immigration in the United States, and um, it's chaotic. Everyone's breaking into their little communities. Um, there's no sense of unity and and and, and uh, you know uh, common purpose or or desire to do things together anymore. We can't agree on anything. Um, it's chaotic. I mean, almost all, I mean, funny thing is that like almost all of our progress, you know, socially was done between the cold end of world war two and you know, like 1980 or so it's like, and that was like during the period of the lowest level of, 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 of immigration ever. It's like we assessed and consolidated. Um, well, it was also the highest and level all of economic growth ever. Yeah, and, but also incredible amounts of technological innovation and the like. And so we didn't need that kind of. We just went to the opposite extreme. We didn't like do a moderate increase in, in immigration. We went whew, beyond, and it's hollowing us out even faster. So, so what um, happens at the end state of a hollowed state? I think hollow states can exist for a long, long time. Um, more and more, of the power goes to corporations. I'm um, already seeing that. There's a tendency now. I, I was I did a report uh, on my global global growth report thing on, on uh, Substack and Patreon is, that looked at an Edelman survey. Edelman Public Relations is the super slick PR organization that handled Microsoft back Windows 95 days. I mean, they were slick. I mean, super sharp, and they were looking at uh, corporate trust. And you know what? Do, what do people trust, and what do people demand of corporations? They found that corporations are far more trusted now than governments worldwide. You know, at least the, the collective West across twenty-three different company or countries, and that people expected corporations start to pick up the slack, start to do what governments weren't doing, and take on bigger roles. And they were willing to politicize corporations and cede to them a lot of control over their lives that. We hadn't. I hadn't expected to see a shift that that market. It was like sixty, seventy percent. Are are we gonna with all the trends that you're describing? Are we all gonna gradually become authoritarianism f fans of one flavor or another? One of the weird things about the current environment is that you know we wiped out fascism as a system back in forty five, right? Communism, one big bureaucracy, U.S. kind of this chaotic system, but government was portion of it and a lot of corporate bureaucracies and there was everything was corralled in, in, in a kind of a common framework. But as we got into this new network age, almost everyone's become fascist of one state. I mean, China's become fascist. Uh, US is, is, is headed towards a, a, a fascism, a network fascism. And network fascism is different than um, traditional fascism. Uh, in some ways, but um, it works on the same principles that you create a bunch of enemies, internal and external, and you use that to get a very chaotic system of corporate and, and government bureaucracies and NGOs and individuals aligned and facing in the same direction. And that you have to hype and hype and hype those enemies to keep everyone focused. Um, and it works. It works really effectively. I mean, especially on in the networked environment, it's much more effective than the big live stuff that Goebbels put in place. Um, it's almost more pervasive, more insidious. And, uh, and it, it, that, it almost for sure will get worse with AI. Oh yeah, and so in Ch you know, China does the same thing. It's like focus on the enemy, and that works in the network tribalism. I, I see that it's usually anti something, and it's anti. 
it's never for something like traditional right. tribalism. It's always against anti-racism, anti-colonialism, anti-whatever, anti-Israel. And um, in climate change, is it's it, anti-fossil fuel companies. Correct. And so, yeah, exactly. So the problem with the fatal flaw of fascism, obviously, or maybe not obviously to people who think it's some other jackboots or something, because you got jackboots in communist systems too. It's like, or secret police in those systems too. The fatal flaw of fascism is that it eventually declares, gets you into war with everybody. And you hype up the internal threat from internal enemies to the extreme that you're putting them in concentration camps and killing them. And they kill 12 million people because they, you know, they're eternal threats that are so dire. Or you declare war and invade everybody because everybody's an existential enemy that's presenting an imminent danger. And it's self-defeating that way because they get rolled. It's that you can't be at war with everybody all the time. What What is the cultural antidote to what you're describing? And to the listeners and viewers of this program, what's the individual antidote to some of the things, some of the risks that you're outlining? I'm big into localism or you know local control, regional control. The more layers of decentralization we have between us and the, and the global environment, the better. Um, and in terms of technology, I'm big into having more and more control, open source AIs and the like, that that could be a safety valve. I hate the idea that you know all the apps and everything else go through these big mega stores on the, on the platforms, charge 30% tax on everything they do, but and also limited in, in what can be offered and what can't be. Um, I want to see it more like a decentralized modding community for the AR glasses and everything where I could get mods from all these different things and load them up and use them uh, without filters. But in order for some of those things to happen, people need to be educated about these risks first. Otherwise, there won't be the demand and the push for um, open systems for, for AI. Yeah, it, it takes a long time. I mean, it's like trying to sell social networking in 2001. It's like a couple thousand well, I, people, I mean, right? It's like Trist Tristan no one Harris to hear. is a good friend of mine, and you know they've kind of failed so far on on trying to regulate AI and and some of the uh, initiatives in in DC. I mean, I, I don't oh, know yeah. specifics. I, I talked but to Tristan Tristan too. It's like yeah, it, it, he was up against a a Goliath. I I was hoping that he would just stick with something simple like the data ownership thing. It's like. Once you get the idea that it, you could have a, a kind of a banking style industry managing all our data and there's going to be reams of it, not just their names and phone phone numbers and that kind of crap. I'm talking all the deep data, like your facial expressions and and how you walk and how you, and, and that goes into modeling populations as a whole and, and, and creating simulations and other things that are, are extremely valuable to everybody. Um, what you say, everything you say, how you say it. So first of all, I'm I'm already kind of screwed. There's no way I can go and delete my Twitter posts and right. Facebook because I've been out there quite a lot. So if AI is modeling me, they've already got a pretty good model. Um, this is really depressing, John. I, I really wanted to talk to you about networked tribalism because I'm worried about polarization and right. the fact that we can't have conversations, that everyone has hot buttons, that if you say this, you're a Putin apologist, or if you say this, you're a fan of the fossil fuel companies, and we can't have a balanced conversation about the human predicament in our reality. And you've kind of indirectly convinced me that things are worse than I thought. Yeah, but you know, it might be ugly, but I think we're going to muddle through. I'm just hoping that the you know we can avoid a lot of the a lot of the badness that's going to end up happening. Um, probably not, but uh, you know I'm I'm betting on on hopefully that we get out into space. I think that if we can't get into space, I think we could end up just collapsing to nothing. When when you say get out into space, what do you mean by that? is that we have to start developing and expanding beyond earth. And um, my guess is that Elon will probably, I mean, I wrote a little article about how to accelerate it using asteroids and the crap, but I, my guess is that Elon is probably going to end up putting his dojo supercomputer for training AIs in space because he can get solar power cheaper than he can get on earth and volumes that, and scalable volumes that far beyond what you can get on earth in the current environment. Um, 
particularly since those supercomputers now and, and, and most of the cloud stuff that goes a, a, around with AI is so power intensive, it, it, it chews up the power of a, of a medium-sized city and then it's growing even more. So if Elon wants uh, orders of magnitude more compute uh, than he has now, you think he his plans are well, to do that in space? Running these big clusters to train AIs and to host AIs um, is ex almost all power related costs. Mm -hmm. Eighty percent of of the cost of actually doing running those systems is, is is energy costs, and energy costs are going up. Seems like everywhere here on a, mm -hmm. terrestrially, and here you have this window in space that he alone really can access, um, and that can allow once that starts going once he starts building those big solar arrays and then he starts to look at ways to do it cheaper i think he could end up pulling in asteroid materials and and the reason why those asteroid materials are going to be so valuable is not just because they're equivalent of what you can get on earth and, and cheaper it's that it's already in space <laughs> and you use those materials to start building arrays and more and more solar arrays i'm talking like solar arrays that could equivalent be equal to several diameters of the earth. I mean, there's so much space up there. And um, running our cloud infrastructure first, and then eventually over time becoming capable of, of, of beaming down um, energy to use microwaves for uh, you know swing production in, in, in various locales that need it, that are paying through the nose for alternatives. Um, but I, potentially electricity is almost too cheap to meter if done correctly in space if that's all plausible which i'm right. pretty skeptical of because it takes energy and there's a payload and you have there's mining and there's zero gravity and how do you drill an asteroid in zero gravity and there there, there are yeah. constraints i'm not even worried about the asteroid portion i'm just the the actual that potentially downstream but once you regularize space in the near earth environment because everything else becomes much much easier what what are your opinions about climate change and the ecological destruction of species and some of the you know the the environmental limits that we've already uh well exceeded and how, to, how does that fit into this story oh you know, it's just a thermodynamic um box that we're in the, the, the human civilization has reached limits of its environment and uh, has a dissipative system uh we either expand and go out or we die there's no going back. There's no turning back that system. It's too complex. It's operating too far from thermodynamic equilibrium. And uh, we're just dumping this entropy into our living environment and we will die heat death. <laughs> we, will, we, will, we will totally run out unless we create a larger external environment that we can expand into. And that's if we don't get to type one and type one civilization is that we pull in as much energy or generate as much energy as the earth absorbs um, from the sun on a daily basis, uh, then we die. It's like keep it's like a it's like a shark. We got to keep on going forward. We got to keep on getting to bigger and bigger environments or we 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 perish. It's inevitable. Coupling that with two other things you said earlier that um, Elon Musk is one might describe as unstable and number two he's the only one that's accessing uh as has been the the founder uh and the the um first what's the word for the early adopter of of doing things in space so doesn't right. that give you pause a little bit <laughs> yeah i mean it's mitigated just a slight bit by the fact that uh bezos has blue origin still he's pouring billions in and that if uh and he has a big cloud computing company, is that um, if Musk starts hosting the cloud in space for cheaper energy, Bezos won't be far behind. And then there'll be a race to see who can get the most cloud infrastructure built running at a levels of efficiency you can't match at the terrestrial level. I don't think this is going to happen uh, for various technical reasons, but a more mm. larger um, systemic reason, which is if that happens, then the great simplification is not true and um, or not going to happen. And I, I think we um, our space exploration um, success has been based on an era of energy surplus, which is 
ending uh, and we're, we're masking it by creating debt and central bank supports. Um, but I just don't know that we're fiscally able to do the magnitude of things like that, even Elon Musk. That, that's why I came up with a, trying to come up with ways to simulate an internet boom where we raise trillions in capital based on speculation and, and, and becoming on paper, very, very valuable. Um, and that we build out the infrastructure that is needed to, for it to start to create its own weather dynamic, its own economy. Um, and that, uh, if, if done correctly, there, it, it could generate the energy surplus we want and the resource surplus we need, um, at infinitum. It, I mean, the whole solar system is available for us to take advantage of. It's just getting over that cost barrier. Right now we're sitting at this kind of, we're at that, uh, step function level and we're looking up and seeing that cliff up there and we can't seem to get out of it. But, um. If we can, if we can fool the system into into getting us up there, um, or get Musk to kind of create a little stampede on his own by by doing something that um, everyone else wants to emulate, that, then um, then we might get out of this. But uh, otherwise, it's just more entropy on Earth, more social entropy, more physical, you know, pollution entropy, um, more chaos done i would love to have you back to uh unpack some of this maybe on a round table with other experts in this uh sure. on all this stuff um but as is um i, I really appreciate your time this is a an unusual interview for me because i usually am talking specifically about ecology or oil or neuroscience and i haven't talked to too many tech experts in in this way and again, the only reason I invited you is because I've been following you for over 20 years and I know that you have core insights on this stuff. So um, usually at the end of, of my interviews, I ask a, a few personal questions uh, of my guests on their first interview. Sure. I, I hope you don't mind. But I think you've probably freaked some people out that are watching this show. Do you have any personal advice to the human beings, just as humans, on what people uh, can personally do during this time of what some call the meta crisis uh, now uh, on top of network tribalism and AI and, and other risks that you discuss? What kind of advice do you have, John? Don't let what's going on in the online information space, the abstract space, dictate your mood and, and, and how you think. Um, focus on living life, you know, grow your garden, uh, raise your family, spend time with them, uh, work with them to, you know, make sure that they're as successful as possible and live great lives, um, live up to their potential. Uh, you know, I got a big house and I got a, you know, my two youngest are living here and working from home at great companies and, you know, they're about to start their own lives with, but I want them here as long as possible, which is great. And, um, focus on that. And if you can do that, that will level set you, make you feel a lot better about the world. Uh, you can't, you know, and, 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 and you can focus on um, improving that and, and, and looking for signs that that actually is being infringed upon or, or by this chaotic external environment and taking measures to kind of uh, mitigate that damage. But um, don't let this... We live in this abstract meta space almost too much now. I mean, I've been doing it since you know, since ninety four, ninety five. You were doing the same thing. It's like uh, I think we've developed our sea legs to a certain extent that we're not too thrown by th how things are maneuvering and how things are swaying to and fro. But um, balance, <laughs> balance. This is a marathon. Even if it, even if there is chaos, it's still a marathon. That's good advice. Um, what do you recommend to young people? And just like you said, there's not too many people under the age of 50 that watch TV. There's not too many people under the age of uh, 30 that listen to this podcast. But what recommendation do you have for 20 somethings um, becoming aware of all this stuff? I don't know. This, I think it's probably the coolest environment to be alive in ever. I mean, in terms of the opportunity and things you could learn. I, I remember 
living before the internet and then watching it turn on, you know, bit by bit by bit by bit. I mean, right in the kind of cat birds and watching this, it was like my brain turned on. I mean, it was like, wow, this is cool. And the, see the opportunity to learn things and to work almost anywhere. I mean, I'm employing guys that, like who do software for me at times. Uh, we're sitting on a beach in Turkey, <laughs> you know, um, living a great life. Or, you know, uh, you can work online like my daughters do and you can live anywhere. You can stay in a family house or you could go live in London for a while or go live in a, a, a cabin in Steamboat Springs or whatever. It's like the world is your oyster. It's awesome. Um, and uh, your ability to bootstrap yourself to wherever you want to be and wherever you want to go um, is easier than ever. And granted, there are the threats out there um, that you know can impinge on you in the future, but um, develop skill sets that mitigate those damages. Learn how to grow stuff. Learn how to you know fix stuff. Learn how to do all those things. As long as you have the skill sets, it doesn't mean you have to do it all the time. But if the if the problems arise, then you can actually deal with it. What do you care most about in the world, John? Oh, family. Um, that's a pretty easy one. Pretty much drives my life. And a far second would be like, you know, just dogs and things like that. Just like daily conveniences. Well, dogs like, are like, family. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've I, kind of created kind of, I'm, I'm more of a monk. I'm very kind of happy with that. I was happy at the Air Force Academy when I was up and, you know, isolated from everybody else working all that time. It's, it was, it's comfortable. If you could wave a magic wand and there was no personal recourse to your decisions, what is one thing you would do to improve uh, human or planetary futures? Develop space. I mean, it, it, as much as everyone has a negative reaction to it, um, I've been thinking about it since I became an astro astronautical engineer, failed astronaut candidate, uh, is that, uh, Never really got aligned. Shuttle blew up before I was had a chance. So we have to keep on going forward, and um, we've stalled out at this at the step function. We got it. And if I could wave my wand and say, "Let's spend this money or invest this money and build this infrastructure," um, then start regularizing our use of it, opening up our horizons, and looking forward into a world that to future that has unlimited potential, I would do that. Because if you're just looking at your navel, looking at fixing the things that are wrong with this world, there's a never ending hole that will go down forever. It's like looking into the abyss, you know, that famous, you know, uh, romantic painting, right? Gazing into the abyss. Uh, that's where we're at right now is we keep on gazing into the abyss and we're not looking up. We're not hearing that kind of, you know, the roar of a of a star, you know, just it's out there burning and and and, and calling to us. It's like, gotta go. It's time to get up, leave the womb, man. <laughs> you know, was, we're in this womb and we don't want to leave. And mom's like, get out, and we're not. And I would like to see us get out. My view, uh, and I don't know as much about it as you, is it actually would require a magic wand uh, to make that happen. But um, but we shall see. And. Um, I really respect you and your research and, and your opinions. So I'd, I'd love to have you back, uh, maybe take a deeper dive on some of this stuff. Do you have any closing words uh, to sum up this conversation for our viewers? Sure. Uh, since a good portion of it at the end there was dedicated to the space, I got involved in the interactive television effort early on to build something like the internet back in 93 with the big telcos. And they could not. There was no vision from that point forward that internet would ever be built. It's too much money, hundreds of billions of dollars. The, out, the payoff was too uncertain. They couldn't imagine what they do with too many technological uh, steps that they still would have to discover and figure out a ways to do. And they abandoned it. And here comes this internet. It's done in the right way, the right kind of bootstrap. And it got built in a decade, a decade, something that never should have happened but it did and it's crazy how it built out so quickly and i think we can do that here with this with space same way just ignite it in the right way and then it just goes and it won't end 
it won't end in, in our lifetimes at least the the first thought that came to my mind hearing uh your appeal there is um can you imagine networked tribalism with ai in space yeah yeah it, it gets pretty ugly and <laughs> it uh but you know if you do it right at the at the start which we probably won't but you can mitigate a lot of those problems um just like the you know data ownership and ais if we've done it right initially um everyone would have more participation in the upside potential of these ais and that would change the dynamic in terms of fear of, of where they're going and how they're how they're developing a good bit if you knew that you had some if whatever this is going to develop into this ai economy that you had some upside potential there that all boats were rising it would change your perspective on the on where we're going in a big way but the way it's looking right now is that a few boats will rise to the moon and back and then the rest of us will sink get sucked dry i just want to see this doing it right thank you uh for your insights and Thanks, your Dave. continued work um to be continued john thank you if you enjoyed or learned from this episode of the great simplification please follow us on your favorite podcast platform and visit thegreatsimplification.com for more information on future releases this show is hosted by nate hagan's edited by No Troublemakers Media and curated by Leslie Batlutz and Lizzie Siriani.